Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Spark Building uh, at Cardiff University. Delighted to have you here tonight uh, to listen to our great colleagues, who I'll introduce very shortly. Uh, just to say, I'm Chris Taylor. I'm the Academic Director of the Social Science Research Park, which is a institution at Cardiff University. Um, we are undertaking valuable research, social science-led, working across different disciplines across the university, but a critical change to that work is this building also has non-academic organizations co-located with us. So that creates a different environment, a different culture, a different community, and a different kind of sense of purpose to what we're trying to do here. So there are organizations here from the public sector, private sector, and third sector. Um, so it's a very exciting place to be and working. Uh, many of you hopefully will come through these doors again if you've not been here before. Uh, through various different reasons and working with our colleagues here in the university. So tonight we're focusing as part of the Festival of Social Sciences sponsored by the Economic Social Research Council but we're also supported tonight by the Academy of Social Sciences and I'll mention uh, the Academy again shortly focusing on the role of social science research to tackle loneliness and enhancing well-being and in society. Obviously a very, very important issue of growing concern um, Various different reasons why loneliness particularly has become a bit of a focus for policymakers. It's very tangible. Something can be done about it. Uh, it makes it a very useful tool for thinking about how mental health and well-being can be improved. And has, has received lots of attention, particularly... It was receiving attention just before the pandemic, but has particularly received more attention simply because people's changing work patterns have created loneliness and isolation but also changes to digital society, changes to family structure, and so on. So we're going to have uh, a panel here, a panel of experts who work in different areas around mental health and well-being. They're going to introduce themselves. They're going to say a little bit about what they do, what their research is, and then we're going to pretty much hand it over to the floor and to you, the audience, to ask questions, prompt discussion points that you would like to hear from our panel, but also from colleagues in the room. Tonight we're recording this event, the Academy of Social Sciences, they will be using the recording from this event as part of their campaign called uh, Election 24, and they've got a hub on their website called Election 24, in preparation for the general election next year, and they're providing various resources around particular issues and challenges that society faces, where hopefully this will help encourage people to be more familiar with understanding of those issues, for policymakers to be able to engage with that, but critically for voters and the electorate to kind of engage with those issues and learn about them. So uh, that's why we're recording it tonight, and that's why this will be a very useful uh, conversation and debate we'll have, which will be shared more widely than the people who could possibly be in this room tonight. So uh, we'll go through one turn, very quickly, brief introductions, and then we'll hand over to you. If you do have questions and discussion points you would want to raise, we have, you'll have to use a microphone. We've got Rian on here who'll be wave, coming around with microphones. So if you could just wait till you have the microphone in front of you and then you can proceed with your question discussion. And I will hopefully chair this so we finish promptly at five, uh, if not uh, within five minutes past five, just in case I make a mistake. So we're going to start off. So Stefan, would you like to first of all introduce yourself, please? Mm -hmm. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Hi. Uh, my name's Stefan Collishaw. I'm a professor. I'm uh, based in something called the Wolfson Centre for Young People's Mental Health, which is um, the, a dedicated uh, research centre focused on understanding why young people develop problems such as depression and anxiety and what we can do to help uh, prevent such problems and how we can help young people who are experiencing such problems. My kind of own research interests are uh, various. Uh, one question I do a lot of work on is trying to understand why young people today are experiencing more difficulties with their mental health than generations in the past. And I thought this debate today, I, I was really struck by the topic. It's really important. It's really timely. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, we've just had a major report uh, published um, covering 44 different countries um, in Europe showing that one in three, and Wales and England in particular, um, 
fared quite poorly, actually, in terms of young people's mental health. And uh, what, to me, looks like a shocking statistic is that a third of 15-year-old girls in the UK are reporting that they feel lonely most of the time or all the time. And what we know from a developmental perspective is that's, that's distressing to young people, and that should be sufficient in its own to, on its own to kind of draw attention to that. But actually, loneliness is also closely linked with mental health and has strong predictors, predictive value, I guess, to life course outcomes such as educational outcomes, success in occupations, health and even life expectancy so tackling this is a really important societal challenge um, so thank you with that I'll hand on thank you thank you thank you hear me um, my name is Beth Cummins I'm a senior lecturer in marketing at um, Swans University in the School of Management um, I guess our research today um, comes from a different angle uh, so we're looking at um, purposeful business what that means to be purposeful and the impact that has on um, well-being in society. Um, interestingly, though, um, from a marketing perspective, um, I deliver social media marketing, um, where we talk about those areas in terms of well-being, impact of um, mental health, um, and obviously the, the use of um, social media in a marketing perspective. So this is of, of interest and, and timely as well um, from that side of it. But as I said, our research today um, that we've sort of showcased outside is more around you know, the um, connections uh, from a business perspective and looking at you know, sort of the responsibilities of business then in relation to well-being um, and being purposeful. Okay, hello. Uh, <clears throat> my name's uh, Heaven Grillim and I'm a lecturer in social policy. Um, up there in Bangor, Bangor University, North Wales. Um, and uh, today, uh, you know, with colleagues, uh, got a couple of PhD students, we did the presentation and an interactive event with mostly really uh, very engaged school children. We were looking um, at the universal basic income. That was our kind of focus today. So that's kind of an interest of ours at the moment. Um, and uh, with co other colleagues from University of Salford, and Manchester, we're editing a book on universal basic income. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of at that stage where I've done a lot of literature review on universal basic income. So every article, hopefully, I had a good look at most of them anyway. And um, I've got a PhD student doing work on the universal basic income in Africa um, with a focus on Ghana. Um, and obviously, from a social policy perspective, I have a very broad, um, wide definition of what social policy is. There's no boundaries, really, on what affects social policy um, and in you know kind of really recent times is the issue of obviously the COVID-19 uh, the, the uh, lockdowns the effects those have had on poverty and of course the cost of living crisis uh, which is the current kind of focus um, and I teach on uh, poverty t poverty module at Bangor and a health module a housing module it's interesting to hear about the next year's general election um, and, you know, the, the policies on housing is very interesting what, um, for example, the Labour Party has proposed in their conference. And, um, you know, I could um, find some faults with, <laughs> with some of that policy. Uh, there's advantages and disadvantages. There's advantages and disadvantages to the universal basic income as well. I'm not here to kind of promote it necessarily, but to think, you know, it, it's an answer to some problems, but not every problem. It's not a panacea. It's not uh, um, an utopian kind of solution, but it's an interesting topic and there's a lot of interest in it globally. All political parties are thinking about it. Only the Green Party in the UK is actually has it as policy. Um, um, and it's, a, it's attractive to the right of the political spectrum as well as the left, which is interesting, and you have to ask the question why that should be. And people like Bill Gates and uh, Jeff Bezos also support the universal basic income. Um, they can support the universal basic income, but not address the issues of low pay and poor quality uh, workers' rights in their organisations. So you, you ask, well, how can they take both that, those stands? You know, um, so those kind of interesting questions. Hi all, um, I'm Fern Davis. I'm a senior lecturer from Swansea University School of Management. Um, I primarily focus on business strategy, um, but I'm also the SDG and the sustainability lead for the School of Management. Um, so again, t taking a slightly different perspective really, um, but evidently SDG 3 and others are certainly relevant here when it comes to well-being and loneliness. Um, in terms of my research, I look at small business social responsibility a lot. Um, I've also worked with the Bevan Commission, so the Bevan Commission are a think tank based at Swansea University, 
um, and we address all matters of health and well-being. So I've worked on a number of research projects um, related to kind of loneliness, well-being, um, and a lot actually during uh, COVID, so long COVID and things such as that and the implications of that. Um, so yeah, I guess I come from a perspective in terms of businesses, social responsibility, and this idea of purposeful business and creating ecosystems and networks that would enable and facilitate um, enhanced well-being through organization so yeah. great thanks you hold on to that okay so this is uh, now your your chance to kind of get involved in in this too so if anybody would like to i mean you might want to introduce yourself talk about what you do in this space if you want to share that uh, but if you've got questions you'd like to ask anybody here on the panel then this is a good time to start doing so who'd like to kick us off with that maybe i think we've got we've got a willing volunteer at the front here haven't we I'm Rachel Bowen. I work for the Older People's Commissioner for Wales. We're obviously very interested in this issue. I suppose a question which I'd be interested in the panel's view on is that often studies around loneliness and isolation can end up being picked up by media and pit generations against each other. So younger people tend to be more lonely than older people. You know, it's not the loneliness Olympics, but how do we avoid that? And you know, what are your thoughts on how we tackle loneliness and isolation across the generations? Great, that's a great starting question. Stefan, do you want to start with this one? Yeah, thanks. I mean, I, I mean, it seems like an obvious thing to say that all of us will be, were once children and we will once be older. And I think it, 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 you know, and I think actually at a sort of, if we track people longitudinally from a life course perspective and some of the studies I work on uh, have been trapped since they were born through childhood, adolescence, adulthood and into old age. And they're really deep connections between what happens as a child to how you develop as an adult and what happens to you when you get older. And they're also important connections between generations. So, you, you know, what happens in one generation of parents and grandparents impacts on s successive generations. And I think, you know, just from a scientific perspective, it, it's, one cannot distinguish or neatly cleave apart different generations and different age groups. It, you know, to me, it makes no sense if we want to think about well-being and health and, you know, and everything else that goes along with that. So I don't know if anyone else wants to pick up on that. I was just going to say from, um, I guess, from a business perspective about building communities as well. Um, so interestingly, some of our research looked at, you know, so the sense of place and again, thinking about, you know, sort of perhaps areas or responsibilities that business have to help and support communities um, as well. And, and, you know, not just operating for profit in those areas, but also giving back to the communities um, as well. And I don't know, I mean, I, I don't know from your research whether or not it's a cultural thing as well. Um, perhaps that we experience, again, perhaps in the, in the UK more. Um, but, you know, some of our research, the wider research looks around infrastructure, looks around, um, you know, what's available to people and how we can sort of facilitate some of that. And, and I guess, you know, because of the way, the very nature of the way things change in terms of how we, um, you know, sort of access public transport or, um, you know, sort of um, shopping now or all online and all of that, you know, type of thing that we lose that perhaps part of our sense of community. And, you know, I think there is a role for business to sort of look at, you know, what they do in the local area to just sort of build some of that as well. Yeah, I would just agree with what's just been said by two of my colleagues. Um, maybe just try and add, you know, like a little bit of understanding why people might be kind of pitching <laughs> young people against older people. It's in some respects the way, I guess, the so-called welfare state's been organised and, you know, the budgets of expenditure of governments and we all know, you know, pensions are the, is the biggest um, uh, budget for the Department of Work and Pensions, running at, I think, about £140 billion. Pounds, and obviously NHS, £180 billion. Pounds. So usually, it has to be said, it's mostly older people benefit from those things, particularly pensions. So um, there's a kind of need to reset to some degree, um, you know, the balance uh, by focusing to some more degree on young people. The problem, I think, is that young people don't register in the minds of politicians because young people don't vote, as simple as that. And if they don't vote, <coughs> they don't have influence. Um, and so they're not going to be invested in. So I think that's, that's a kind of political problem, just to raise the, raise the awareness and the consciousness of young people about the, the importance of participating in the political process. But having said all that, that kind of explains why people have these prejudices. It's obviously 
you know, true that everybody who's lonely, that's a problem for everybody, however old you are, and it needs to be addressed somehow. Um, and, uh, yeah, that, I think that's all I would say. Um, I guess I take a perspective from the university as well. Um, I was at an event recently, and it talked a lot about... Um, facilitating or enabling our younger generations, so whether that's through university courses or school curriculum, etc., in order to um, be analytical and also question data or communication that is provided to them, and this being a huge skill set that is, is going to need to be taught to our, our students and youngsters. Um, so I think that's really important, is actually... Um, having this mindset of, do I believe everything that I see or I hear, or do I believe in, in terms of data or what I'm seeing? And then being able to have those analytic skills to, or make, to make those decisions themselves. Um, yeah, so I think that's quite important in terms of what we're teaching our students and how we're embedding that in, in courses that we might teach as well. Great. Ed's got a question. Brian, let's head. Thank you. Um, yeah, Ed Bridges from the uh, Academy of Social Sciences, and I'm very conscious I'm guilty of the thing that Rachel was talking about of pitting generations against each other, because about 10 years ago, I think I worked on a, a research report uh, which talked about older men in Wales as the loneliest cohort of people in, in the UK, which I suspect was probably true, but you're right, it absolutely does pit generations against each other. Um, but I'm interested in, in two things that I particularly want to ask Kevin and Beth about. So from a policy point of view, Kevin, if there is a problem with loneliness and well-being, what's the lever that needs to be pulled? And are we in a better place in Wales because of the Future, um, uh, future of Wellbeing and Future Generations Act to do that? Um, so I'd be interested in knowing that. And, and Beth, from the point of view of what you're talking about with businesses, you know, you, you say um, they have a, a, a responsibility to their broader community to, to give back, but what does that actually look like in practice and how do you make sure that's something that they they actually do rather than doing sometimes as a kind of add-on benefit if they if they want to and, and are socially benign actors yeah well okay well the in terms of the policy the answer in some ways respects is easy i guess in the sense that you know if you if you read some of the literature on um, inequality um some example um the Spirit Level and all those books by Richard Wilkinson and uh, Kate Pickett, you know, they make the argument pretty effectively, but not necessarily, it's a contested argument for sure. Um, you know, that countries which are more equal tend to have populations that are happier, less lonely, you know, healthier, etc. All the, all the list of indicators according to uh, the, the book, The Spirit Level, um, people do better in countries where there, there isn't the kind of vast inequalities. And, you know, it's, it, the, the critical time in the UK was the 1970s, wasn't it? You know, the end of the 70s, crisis in social democracy was shifted away to a kind of neoliberal, um, you know, Thatcherite uh, way of doing things, free markets, free markets in everything. Um, and more individualistic, I guess we could say. Our society is not more individualistic. And if you look at the kind of happiness surveys, Finland always comes up on top, doesn't it? I'm, I'm sure you're all aware of this, um, year after year. Uh, but when I tell my Finnish friends, they tell me, well, nobody told us, you know. <laughs> it's not their experience. But uh, according to the, the surveys, they come up on top. And you know, countries like Denmark and Sweden, these countries are not without their own problems. You know, I have colleagues in Copenhagen who said they see Copenhagen before um, the COVID pandemic. They've had right-of-center governments there. They... Um, you know, people don't like paying high taxes there, like in, uh, in our country. Um, but everybody seems to gain. They've, they've got this magical, if you like, it's almost like a magical situation where business people are happy, they can make lots of money, but also they have a good welfare state, um, and they've managed to, you know, do almost the impossible. So they have civil society that contributes, which is uh, effective and People are, are, are pleased with the society they have. But you have business doing well. So it's a capitalist society, obviously, but it's kind of regulated and controlled. And they do have a more effective or better welfare state than we do, more, at least more generous welfare state. And it seems to be, um, uh, you know, those kind of countries, people tend to do better. And according to the spirit level, um, levels of loneliness and all the other indicators, crime, um, uh, people tend to feel happier in those countries. So 
so it's a very broad answer I can give you, not a specific one, um, but maybe there's some clues in, in that. Great, I'm going to have to remember the, the question. <laughs> um, in terms of, obviously, being purposeful, I think that it is really difficult, and that is what part of the question in terms of what does that mean and, and what are the drivers for it. And I think it's recognised that, you know, for some uh, businesses, you know, particularly in terms of, sort of resources and how they sort of contribute um, to being purposeful, but they do, whether or not it's recognised. And what we found from the research is when we were speaking um, to a wide variety of organisations, um, it was more often than not, somebody in the organisation who had a passion for it, who was the driver for um, what it, you know, what they perceived to be purposeful. Of course, you know there are um, accreditations, you know, sort of B Corp, um, and you know it's widely recognised in terms of perhaps that recognition. But again, you know, from the research um, that we that we're undertaking is around, I guess you know, how do they get that recogni recognition for the work that they do in, you know, what what does it mean to be purposeful? And it could mean a, a number of different things. And what are they contributing um, to, particularly what we're looking at in terms of the local sort of community? Um, I guess some of that is around perhaps policy in relation to sort of tendering uh, for certain, uh, you know, sort of grants or funding or whatever that might be. And, and it's uh, that's almost um, encouraged them to be able to do that. Again, you know, uh, as Fern mentioned, in terms of when the events that we attended, I think the findings from the Wellbeing and Future Generations Act was that lots of organisations bought into that, but how do they recognise that they're doing it well? And I think, you know, that accreditation uh, becomes a, a bit more difficult. And again, of course, you're back to um, the funding available for going through those processes, for resources to allow you to go through the accreditation. It's more often than not easier for larger organizations perhaps who can dedicate the time to that but our research found you know there was lots of really interesting stuff going on um, the uh, community group that we, we looked at um, is a membership group called for the region and um, we specifically looked at, at, at them in our research um, and they were sort of facilitators of those type of discussions um, and I, I guess part of the challenge is 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 being able to sort of um, gather the good practice that's going on and for people to be recognised as doing the you know, sort of purposeful things without having the accreditation. So it's a bit of a, you know, it, it's a difficult one. I think there are very, you know, there are lots of sort of moving parts with it from a business perspective. But what we generally found was there was an appetite for it and people wanted to, um, you know, sort of recognise sort of the, the, the activity they're doing around purposeful business and to actually engage with it um, as well. Hopefully I answered that question. <laughs> Great. Yeah, yes. Um, so I actually did, sorry, some research um, years ago with Rachel, actually, when you were in the Federation of Small Businesses. Um, and what our research found was that actually, obviously, small businesses were in Wales, 99.1 or however, whatever the percentage might be. So it's a huge proportion in terms of social economic impact. And when we did research with small businesses, we realised that actually they are, they are engaging with a lot of work that is contributing to communities, to society, etc. Um, they just had, new, in fact, 21 plus different terms that they called it. So it's not that this isn't happening, it's just that there seems to be this kind of mismatch when it comes to potentially the impact of SMEs and larger businesses. They're all engaging and they're contributing in some way. But what we found was that smaller businesses were doing silent, sunken CSR. Are. So it was kind of part of their everyday life. Um, we did find that quite often this was kind of sporadic. It was resource-based. It depended on the expertise of those, those businesses. Um, but they were doing it. It was more the recognition of that. So I think there's a lot to do with communication. Um, <laughs> there is research to suggest that SMEs tend to kind of walk the walk, but not necessarily talk the talk. And perhaps <laughs> there's indication that larger businesses are perhaps the other way around. Um, so there was there was a lot of evidence to su suggest that businesses they really are contributing. It's just kind of how and um, there was also this idea that whilst they're doing a lot already, um, whilst yes communication could be improved, then perhaps we work with businesses to understand how it can be embedded within their strategy. So day to day, rather than having kind of more sporadic interaction, which is what we did find with a lot of businesses. Um, related to our work in terms of purposeful ecosystems. That helps in terms of the dissemination of communication and 
again, sorry, referring to SMEs because that's my area of expertise, um, a lot of them rely on other small businesses to actually disseminate information such as this. So it's understanding the different networks and routes and which we can disseminate understanding, whether it's related to SDG3, health, well-being, or whether it's other kind of social areas that we need to be addressing. But yeah, I think that there is a lot that is being done, but it is educating and perhaps finding standards for private sector organisations that are suitable for the different forms of business and sizes. Great, thanks. We've got a question here. Hello, my name is Teresa and I'm a member of the public. <laughs> um, recently I attended a research event where the speaker suggested that loneliness was attributed or largely attributed to perception as opposed to the social environment and that therefore it needed to be targeted by cognitive therapy. Mm. So I wondered, how would you define loneliness and do you have any ideas of how cognitive therapy would target perception as opposed to trying to change somebody's social environment? It's a good question. Who would like to tackle that? <laughs> Stefan? <laughs> I think it's a really important question. And uh, we, had a, we had a very good talk on loneliness actually just a couple of few last week uh, by GP and he did draw the distinction between solitude and loneliness and there is a distinction and you know it's not necessarily being on one's own it's you know you can feel lonely if you're in a group and so there is an element of perception to it but I think I, I'm, I'm not a clinician, so I'm not going to speak to, to, to the efficacy or the, or the appropriateness of CBT, but it seems to me that social institutions, communities, social structures such as families, friendship groups, businesses, are central to kind of tackling loneliness. It's, it's not something that a person should have to, you know, even with help, tackle on their own. And I think in some of my own research where, where I've looked at resilience in, in young people who faced really enormous challenges, bereavement, maltreatment, uh, parent mental illness, one of the, you know, the, the common factors that, that distinguishes those who do surprisingly well and those who are more vulnerable is social support. That comes through in all of those, as well as related concepts such as stigma, uh, community support. Now, I know that doesn't directly speak to the perception, you know, perceptions of loneliness, but I think it'd be unwise to dis discount the importance of social structures and uh, w however one conceives of those. Um, and for young people, probably the most important ones will be their families, their friends, and, and, and their schools. So I'd, I hope I've done, gone some way towards answering your question. Anybody else want to? I mean, I... I it's interesting that quite a lot of the responses are social responses to the issue of loneliness, and yet the definition is one based on perception, largely you know, what you would like versus what you experience. Um, so in effect, it's, it's, your, it's your own personal judgment as to whether you are lonely or not. Nobody can defer that, or, or no GP could even identify it without having talked first it through with the patient. Um, so I think that's interesting. There is a lot of therapeutic approaches in schools uh, with young people, and I think the, the risk is that most of those are undertaken with very little evidence of their e efficacy and the effectiveness of what they do. Now, that doesn't mean they're not effective, but often these therapeutic approaches to children's well-being in schools kind of get a bad name, not because they don't work, but because we just don't, simply don't know enough about how well they work. And, of course, you need clinical trial types solutions to understand really how effective some of these things are. And I just don't think there's been the investment in that research, would be my view, as to helping us guide us in terms of whether they have a role or not. So in, in, instead, policymakers, I think, inevitably focus on the social factors, the, the kind of community infrastructure stuff, rather than the, the personal. I think one thing just to kind of note is that loneliness 
is often associated or can be associated with, you know, it's more common if you are feeling down, if you're feeling depressed, if you're feeling anxious. And, and those are absolutely problems that, n that need help, whether that's socially and also through, for example, things like cognitive behavioral therapy. So I think there's, a, there, there, there's room for both there and it's not to discount one or the other. Hi, uh, Rhys Denton. I'm a research manager actually at a clinical trials unit. Um, and uh, we actually had a presentation today very much echoing what you've said, Chris, um, where we have been looking, reviewing some of the interventions that we've been trialing in schools with younger people, mainly around people with uh, neurodevelopmental mm -hmm. disorders or uh, learning difficulties, those sorts of things. But actually, an awful lot of the results that we've been getting have been very much, you know, the interventions that we're trialing are actually not as effective as we need them to be or th to have the impact that we want to do. So I kind of echo a lot of what was being said by the panel of a lot of it is social because in a way, once we're getting to the point of delivering an intervention in childhood, that that's almost, we've gone too far. We've made the mistake already. We shouldn't be looking at it from a treatment. I, I mean, we look in a very specific community, but I think there's, there's fixes that we could have in earlier that we, we don't currently have. So I suppose building on that uh, and the question for the panel is if you could uh, deliver sort of one change or one intervention or a policy idea or something that you think would make a difference in your specific areas, what would that be? Um, okay, so for businesses, I guess it would be making sure that there was some kind of institutionalization of their responsibility and some way of reporting that. Um, I think that currently we do have those methods. Um, but based on my experience of having worked with the Bevan Commission, there's a lot about kind of prevention rather than treatment, which I'm sure you, you experience or you hear of a lot. So I think it would be putting something in place to perhaps communicate or an education piece with the, the general public um, in terms of methods to uh, prevent rather than get into that point of intervention, perhaps. Um, so, yeah, sorry, that's perhaps not my area of expertise. Okay. Yeah. So I think I'd go back to the UBI, so <laughs> kind of easy answer in a sense, but um, there's a lot of pilot studies being done on the UBI um, right across the world, you know, and there's a pilot study currently obviously happening in Wales with care leavers from... Um, 18 to 24 year olds until 2025, I think 500 care leavers, and they're each given 1,200 pounds monthly, which is obviously non means tested and it's non conditional, so they don't have to be necessarily working, but they can work if they want to. So uh, it'd be interesting to see the results of that um, uh, pilot, which is going to be next year, has been evaluated by um, UCL Professor Marmo, is I think part of the consultation on that, so that would be kind of interesting. But the, the evidence, if you look at the evidence, and I've looked through um, numerous articles and books and stuff on the pilots, um, it's quite clear that uh, people's mental health actually improves <laughs> when they, they have um, uh, UBI, you know, when they get this payment, um, people's participation in society, people can do things they didn't, couldn't do before. For example, you know, if you're an artist, you know, you, the state's not going to pay you to be an artist, but with the UBI, you could. Um, carers, um, you know, it makes it more um, financially viable for carers and particularly parents maybe who choose to stay at home with their children. Um, people are on low pay, the gig economy, very, you know, precarious, precarious uh, careers or employment, zero-hour contracts, um, all those kind of stuff which contributes to people's sense of uh, insecurity, you know, kind of social insecurity in our society. Um, most people, uh, most households where, who are und living under the poverty line, 60% of median income, have at least one person in employment, but they're in very low employment. Um, you know, so all those factors, if, if the UBI does kind of address those, um, and makes it um, you know, likely that you can participate more in society, and all these can contribute to um, reducing that feeling of loneliness because you have the resources and you can do things, you can invest in education, you can go on an educational course. And that's what the pilot uh, study showed, that um, people actually went on courses, they invested in uh, training, they invested in setting up a small business. They, you know, very few people actually 
uh, wasted the OBI um, on alcohol or whatever, you know, going, going to parties on holidays. Uh, so most people actually used it constructively, and I'm sure the Welsh pilots will obviously repeat the, these results. You know, the findings will be confirmed. Um, so that kind of thing can help with uh, loneliness and isolation, not investing in yourself, losing a sense of life purpose and having, uh, you know, something to get up to do and to look forward to in the mornings uh, and be part of other people, other groups, students, um, finding a nice job that you like doing. Or if you, if you don't want to work, you know, do you want to do some painting or some arts and crafts, then UBI can help that. And, um, you know, all the evidence from all the pilot studies show that um, people's mental health improves and sense of well-being improves. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess, obviously, from our perspective, it's, it's, it's a different, um, different perspective we're looking at, um, I, I, I guess. So for us, I think, you know, in terms of education, it is really important um, and the whole um, sort of remit or concept around sort of well-being has, has obviously sort of come to the forefront um, from a higher education perspective. You know, we, we do have a lot of initiatives uh, that are put in place. We do have a lot of support um, in relation to, to students. But I think, you know, if we look at the um, connection between perhaps that type of support and um, understanding compared to perhaps the, the curriculum and what that, that means in sort of building in um, interventions, then that's probably where the gaps are. As we, you know, we do, um, you know, it, it's a big remit, um, but also, you know, how we're preparing our young people to go into the workforce. You mentioned, you know, obviously resilience, um, those different sort of aspects, um, and how it sort of fits in alongside the curriculum. So there will be sort of indep independent areas or silos who are sort of focusing on it within their own um, teaching. But I guess we perhaps haven't got a, a clear indication of what that means. And, you know, again, you know, with something like the, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, obviously specific to Wales, um, be, being a Welsh institution, it, it is obviously um, of importance to us. It's balancing, you know, where our students come from and where they're going to go to, with, if stay in Wales or, or sort of go elsewhere. But also, you know, having that clear understanding of what it means, or those different aspects of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, what it means from a curriculum perspective um, and how we can sort of build that in. So I know... As I said, you know, we're looking at it from a different uh, perspective, but I do think um, some of the challenges we are, are seeing from an education perspective fit in with all of the discussion today. Um, you know, those are the you know, loneliness, for example, you know, when students come and they, then they move away from home um, and the responsibility of academics as well as our professional service staff. Um, but for us to have that sort of understanding of what that possibly means and how we could build that into our general sort of day to day activity as well would be important. Thanks. Um, I guess one observation is if we think about loneliness and health and well-being, as I said sort of earlier, my view is, is one needs to think lifelong and actually sort of investment in young people will pay long-term dividends across the life course, not just in terms of loneliness, but also in terms of uh, broader societal outcomes, health, um, economically as well. And I think the sort of critical question to, to, to ask is what works for whom and when? And so my, my answer might be sort of investment in research. And actually, if we think about investment in research in health generally, a tiny fraction goes into thinking about young people and young people's mental health, given the scale of the, the, the challenge that we're facing as a society and, and the increasing level of that that challenge um, yeah and I think the other point I'd like to make is I don't think it should be a choice between prevention targeted intervention and treatment because that those different levels are essential for different children different young people given their particular circumstances one shouldn't choose between those all three of those are, are needed but in an evidence-based way can I just add to that, just a very brief point. Yep, very quickly, um, yeah. Yeah, you know, um, I'm just thinking in the fact that um, since COVID, you know, so many children have developed mental health problems as a result of lockdown, etc., and the isolation. Um, and also, I think it's the figure something like one in ten children now don't go to school, and that's 
you know, as a result of COVID as well, they haven't gone back to school, so lots of children are missing school. And obviously those children are from uh, uh, poor socioeconomic backgrounds, so it's in, in the long term it's going to increase inequality, uh, income inequality, and poverty. Um, it's a huge issue. And um, I just remember f a few years ago, um, Frank Field, who's an expert in child, po well, expert in poverty, was also emphasizing the importance of the foundation years, those years between, well, just before birth and up to about five or six, that that's where we need to put the investments. That's the really, really important years. And Professor Marmo from the um, Institute of, um, in London, the University College London, looking at social determinants of health, also says the foundation years is so crucial um, and it's a lifelong thing because if, you, if you're poor in childhood, you're likely to be poor in adulthood. And if you're ill in childhood, you know, you're likely to be ill in adulthood as well. So to break those cycles is very difficult. And the answer is not always um, to give higher state benefits. Sometimes the answer is to actually invest in things like family centers and um, youth centers and all that kind of stuff. So you can teach skills and help these children. Um, otherwise, you know, the social mobility is just going to be a myth in our society. And to a large extent it is, as the Social Mobility Commission points out. Um, so unless you, you kind of, in, in, you know, the, pr the, the, the most priority, I think, and a lot of people think, is kind of kids, early, the early years, because it's going to make a whole difference throughout, throughout, throughout the whole life course. Thanks. We've got two questions. We're going to take two together, or maybe three together, actually. There's one just, no, sorry, sorry, Anna, just at the front here, sorry, just there in the middle, second row, and then one at the back, please, yeah. We'll take those two Hi. and then the third one on the right. Thank you. Hi, uh, Karina Patterson from Bangor University. Um, there's, within all the students, and I've got them to put their hand up this week, about how many of them are addicted to social media and their phones. And I've got a daughter who's just started secondary school last year. And she's been suffering loneliness in the fact that her friends are on their iPhones and aren't playing and talking in the playground. And she's got a dumb phone, which is an old-fashioned Nokia, um, because I'm aware of all these things. And they don't know how, and one of her friends is extremely lonely. Because she's all just, all she's doing at home and everything else, well, she's got friends. So it's some, you know, I think that social media and the university students as well, they've had really interesting conversations with me about flirtations and not being able to talk to anybody and flirting on the online, but unable to talk to them in person. So I think for the young generation, there's a huge issue there. Starting in secondary schools, but probably actually in primary schools, there's a shocking amount that got loads of digital devices in, in primary schools that actually isolates them from having from making a fool of themselves from recovering and I think and, and actually having meaningful kind of friendships yeah. um, that needs to be addressed um, and the other thing is linked to that is that there's, n there's nowhere for the secondary school kids to go and be creative and hang out and yeah. be yeah. structured yeah. thank you so we'll take another one at the back please thank you oh no on the there that's it hi um, my name is Stella I'm a PhD student from Bangor Uni uh, my question is on universal basic income. Um, so, and Dr. Gulam, when you were giving a talk on, I mean, UBI, you uh, mentioned that there has been um, a lot of parallel studies on UBI around the world. And all of these uh, parallel studies um, came out, I mean, the result shows positive, right? You mentioned some of them. And it's good to see the Welsh government currently um, piloting the UBI. So my question is, do you think um, the Welsh government will be ready to implement a full UBI if the current pilot study comes out and the result is, is positive, that uh, it has positive well-being um, on the um, care levers? Do you think the Welsh government is worthy to, uh, I mean, is ready to implement it? And secondly, um, what is your take on the political um, aspects or political ideology around the UBI? Thank you. And then lastly, the third one, just in the red. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, uh, I'm Kerry Dixon. I'm a HR business partner at Cardiff University. So my a question and my focus was obviously going to be in terms of the workplace and what we could be doing as workplaces in Wales and how we could invest in people now for future generations or when people um, leave the workplace. But based on the conversation that we've had, I would also like to ask what impact do you think social media has had in terms of loneliness for younger people? So whilst um, it's previously, I think, 
been seen as positive from a connectivity perspective. Do you think that actually that's flipping now to become more of a negative because we've created the expectation of 24 hours availability? So actually that is likely to then have an impact if people are not having that constant contact. There's that bit, but also the what could we be doing as workplaces now? Great, thanks. Uh, let's take. Uh, let's start with the UBI one very quickly, yeah, I'll, if that's yeah, okay. I'll, I'll deal with that quickly. Um, yeah, it's interesting question. It's a good question, Stella. Um, Stella's doing a PhD on um, UBI in Africa, focus on Ghana. Um, yeah, uh, Welsh government um, is. They've said they've used the words. They they they're doing the pilot, and then with the in intention of rolling it out, whatever that means. Um, but they, you know, in reality, they actually they more likely they are more, they are calling it um, more often uh, basic income. You know, they're not actually referring it to it as the universal basic income. So obviously, the universal means it's available to everybody. Well, there's never been a pilot that's been totally universal, and there's a need for that kind of thing to happen if it's going to be really tested out. Maybe in one big city, for example, everybody gets the UBI. That would be a good pilot. Um, so, yeah, they're talking about it as a basic income rather than universal basic income. And no, they're not, in my view, <laughs> uh, ever going to roll it out. Um, however, they might continue uh, having a, new, uh, a basic income for care leavers um, or some groups in society. I think that's likely to happen if the evidence is positive. So it's not really an UBI, it's a, a basic income uh, pilot in reality. And I think they will probably continue it with people who qualify on the basis of poverty. Thanks. I, I was involved in a review of UBIs and the biggest weakness of the pilots around the world was that no pilot ever introduced how they would keep it going. And that was always the that's been the major flaw of all the pilots in any situation. They just didn't plan for what it would be to roll it out forward. Hence, none of them have ever turned into anything longer term. Right, who's going to take some of the social media questions then? We've got young people on social media, plus the workplace. Do you want me to start on... You can start it. It's going to be an interesting people. one. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's an important question, and um, Gene Twenge in America has published some you know, quite convincing argument that the sort of increase that we've seen in young people's mental health problems has coincided with the, you know, and it's also shown a sort of sharp upturn at around the time when uh, social media became ubiquitous um, in young people. Um, she does caution, you know, it's, it's correlational. We can't draw causal inferences from two trends in society at the same time. Others, such as Amy Auburn, have sort of argued that the data is really not very convincing that time spent online is correlated with mental health. My own view would be is we shouldn't measure, you know, it's about measurement and, and we need to be thinking about the quality of time spent online, what you're doing when you're online, what you're exposed to. We wouldn't ask young people, how much time do you spend outside the front door? You would ask who you do, you know, what are your friendships like, you know, what are you getting up to and so forth. And so we need better measurement of the quality of young people's online environments. When we've talked to young people themselves, they've pointed to, to negatives. They've said, you know, I, I'm going out with my friends and they've all got, they're all staring at their phones and, and it, it affects the, the quality of that social interaction. Others have said, you, you know, if you think about COVID and lockdown, if you're, you know, 16, you, you know, it would have been terrible without social media. You, you would have been cut off from your friendships. So, it, 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 you know, there's, there's pros and cons to it, most likely. And also different, you know, it's different for different young people. Mm. So um, that would be my take on it. Sorry, it's not a clear answer. Um, yeah, I haven't undertaken any research in this area. I do um, deliver social media marketing module. Um, and interestingly, from that, the discussion from a marketing perspective about who's driving a lot of this activity as well. Um, and I guess going back to you know thinking about responsibility of business, it is a responsibility, I see, in terms of the way that we use in social media from a, from a business perspective. Um, I, I suspect, obviously, it's a, it's a wider discussion around um, the dreaded consumption and the way that, obviously, you know, consumerism is driven as well. Um, you know, there's a lot of, obviously, a lot to unpick with, with that. I mean, interestingly, I was just um, wondering, obviously, the lady asked about, you know, uh, from a HR perspective, 
um, and again, because we've had these sort of uh, discussions sort of post-pandemic, um, you know, where from a work environment, you know, how difficult it is, um, how difficult, sorry, it is in terms of loneliness, you know, to connect with people when we all want flexibility, you know, we, we love flexibility and working from home and, and you know, that, that sort of shift to be able to allow us to do that. Um, but interestingly, you know, sort of how that has impacted on the work environment. Um, I don't know whether you've got any sort of uh, thoughts on that because, you know, I, I found that, you know, certainly if we had sort of um, people joining us during the sort of pandemic, you know, they really lost out on the, you know, sort of meeting people at the sort of photocopier or in the kitchen making a cup of tea. And, you know, that impact on loneliness when you, when you spend a lot of time, you're working time when you're just on your own, really, um, even though we've got Zoom and Teams. <laughs> So I don't know, I, I, sorry to throw it back at you, I don't know what, how you <laughs> found it from a HR perspective. Some, some individuals will have thrived from not having to come into the workplace and I think it depends on the type of individual perhaps that you are and, and your own individual makeup. Um, now in Cardiff University we've got blended working so where possible we try and recreate those team opportunities to get that social interaction and um, we encourage managers to talk to colleagues, and if you're not seeing colleagues, make sure that you're putting time in, but also the importance of having that in-person contact, because there's things that you will miss if you're only seeing people virtually. So we'll try and do things like that, and I think that's what we're trying to do currently. I think what I'm wondering is, is there any more that we could be doing? So that's about supporting people whilst they're currently in our employment. Is there more that we could be doing as a workplace now to prepare people once they, they leave employment? Um, in terms of the longer term loneliness. I've got something to add to this, sorry. I'm Rachel from Bank University and this is a personal experience. Um, <laughs> going back to full time working, social media, I've got two young children. Um, I'm knackered all the time from the day I gave birth to them to now they're <laughs> five and six years old. So when they are on their tablets playing Minecraft, um, I'm probably on my phone watching telly after I've sorted tea and just before bedtime, I don't have quality time with them because I am exhausted and I'm not the only one. When I speak to every other parent on that in my life, they all feel the same. And I think that not only are parents in some ways lonely, um, I quite like being on my own. <laughs> I love um, that side of things. But um, I think there's a loneliness to not feeling like you're being heard with how knackered you are and worrying then about your children's mental health but not having the time to do anything about it and that is a horrific loneliness to feel um and then it snowballs then doesn't it into when they become teenagers you're working full-time your partner's working full-time there's a cost of living crisis and then your children are going through um, mental health issues that you can't solve because you're trying to work to put food on the table. There's no community centres around where we are that can help with the impact. And in my previous job role, I work with adults with a learning disability and loneliness. Uh, sorry, I work with adults with a learning disability and autism on loneliness and finding them friendships and relationships. There wasn't any support there either. So the impact when councils and um, other area, other people, other organisations in the areas of North Wales found out what we did. We were piled on with work. So then I went through burnout and had to leave because my children were being affected. <laughs> so it's the people that want to help, like, for example, me. I don't have any time to volunteer in the project I was working on. I'm knackered. My own children now fault <laughs> because I'm tired trying to help everyone. Um, and I don't think even the money aspect would be fantastic, but the social, the, the support, the everything. Um, yeah, so I just want, sorry, I wanted to add to that because I was so like, oh, so. Yeah, th yeah, that's good. So let's, let's end with this question about support because we want to be positive uh, as we depart the room as well. That's all right. No, because well, no, it's important to talk about it, right? So that's the first thing we need to acknowledge. Um, but where should support come from? Where do we, where should it come from in order for it to be effective, but also where it's not going to be a burden, there's a tension on the other resources elsewhere. Um, I, I, <laughs> no, no, I, I, and uh, I'm with you. I, I, I completely um, understand where you're, you're coming from. I guess just some takers from that. 
And um, as I said, you know, this is not necessarily my area of expertise. Um, about that, I guess, is a lot of, of what perhaps what we're experiencing is around um, technology. Uh, the advancements in technology and, and if we go back to right at the start we were having a discussion I mentioned um, responsibility in terms of building communities and I think you know that's possibly what we have lost in that I mean what you were sort of um, describing you know you sort of in that circle of social media does sort of allow us to see into all these amazing lives and everything else you know it has that impact in terms of you know, that sort of disconnection between reality and what's actually going on, and we sort of get sucked into that. I guess support-wise, and, and, and to think about how we sort of move forward, is, you know, is this an opportunity to, to seek out communities um, and to put things in place, you know, from, a, from a, a work perspective? As I said, you know, we all like flexibility, but to recognise time to spend, you know, sort of just communicating, connecting, um, with no other agenda other than that. And I think, you know, from a business perspective, we more often than not um, are measured, obviously, on outcomes and measured on, you know, so what have we achieved, what have we delivered, and, you know, I don't know, what was the latest sales figures or whatever it is. And we perhaps we lose some of that element to it, and, and maybe that's more of a sort of cultural shift. I don't quite have an answer for that. <laughs> um, but, I, you know, I, I, I have a sense that that's where, you know, people are sort of generally feeling and, and the support needs to be, are there these communities or connections in place that would allow us to do, do that? Um, and with our own institution, you know, we've talked to somebody actually just outside talking about what happens here um, in terms of some of the well-being stuff for staff. You know, there, there are those initiatives and I guess it's um, being part of those initiatives as well and, and taking the time to 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 engage with them otherwise you just lose them and then they, they don't happen again then so so yeah i'm not sorry i'm not sure if that helped but <laughs> yeah I, I i guess where does the support come from and i think the support is essential and i guess like the one thing that people worry about when they think about children and young people where they can have concerns about mental health is that they're not experts and that it requires an expert to to help that child and sometimes expertise is important but no one needs to be an expert in mental health to be supportive and to show empathy and to show concern and and kindness and i think so it, it sounds like a bit of a slogan that you know mental health and support is everyone's business but it really is you know and i think and it and it ups, you know i find it upsetting when people feel reluctant or scared to show support or empathy because they feel they're not expert enough in that particular you know at, at just being supportive so that's one thing i think in terms of wales i think one of the big changes that's that's happened or happening is around our whole school approaches which prioritizes well-being alongside education in the school curriculum and i guess the at the heart of that is the idea that young people have a voice in how their schools are run that well-being is put center stage um and interventions studies in you know in the uk and internationally suggest that whole school approaches can improve mental health that they can be effective reducing bullying improving social relationships in schools so i think schools thinking again just about young people now are important sort of venue but that's where young people spend a lot of their lives and i think a lot of support can be helped fruitfully provided Anne Maston, who's a sort of an expert, and she used, you know, she writes around resilience, and and she talks about ordinary magic. It doesn't require some, you know, so, you know, so it, it's just the things that we do in our everyday life that can make a big difference to, to people when they're feeling down or needing support. Yeah, I was just thinking that, you know, the economist in the room, there might be some economists in the room, uh, will know that, um, you know, the economist J M J um, James Maynard Keynes um, once said that um, we only need to work 15 hours a week. Um, that's enough to generate all the income and the wealth that we, we actually require. So it does make you think, well, why on earth are we all uh, working so hard? And uh, particularly... Um, Poor people, to be honest, you know, pe people on low wages, some of them are doing two or three different jobs. It's, they never see their family, they're driving the white van, you know, kind of deliveries. So if you've seen that film, Sorry We Missed You, um, that kind of Ken Loach film. Um, you know, and we're making huge uh, profits. You know, some, some people are profiteering massively, the billionaires and the, the vast inequalities that's happening. Um, and, uh, you know, the rest of us have all 
have not had the proper pay rise since 2008 when we had the last um, uh, capitalist financial crisis with, uh, and at that time. So, um, you know, and, and I could go back here to the UBI, Universal Basic Income, because, um, and a really very, very important point about automation, because that's um, the real thing that's big challenge is going to happen in the future. If, uh, you know, that we're going to have robots, we're going to have uh, jobs that will disappear. Um, you know, not just actually working class jobs, but quite a lot of middle class jobs will disappear as well. So it's going to affect everybody. Um, and it, just make it, it does make it possible if we choose to go down that road, if we choose that direction or the other direction, that we could all be working four days a week. In, in, you know, it is possible. And uh, that might be supplemented by something like an universal basic income. Um, so I'm just thinking kind of, kind of broadly here, does it have to be like this? No, it doesn't. You know, um, austerity was never an economic policy. It was a political policy. Um, and some people are doing really, really well. And um, this vast inequalities, uh, the super rich um, and uh, the rest, including the middle classes, squeezed and uh, poorer people really suffering in society. Um, yeah, so I guess I echo a lot of what has been said already. Um, but for me, it is making sure that we have those structures in place so that we can have kind of a unified response and awareness with this. So kind of having the structures, whether it's social policy or whatever that might be, but the implementation being at a more local level. So communities, regions perhaps, even they might that might be too, too large. So a scaled approach in terms of implementation, but making sure that we have the structures in place to enable communities to do that. Great, that's great. I just want to go back to the Stefan's point about the kind of small magical moments of kindness. When we did the evaluation of the foundation phase about 10 years ago in Wales, we observed thousands and thousands of classrooms uh, over a three-year period. We measured all the interactions, the pedagogical approaches that were going on in those classrooms, and we looked at children's ice engagement with their learning, their well-being in the classroom, and their educational outcomes, reading and mathematics. The, one, the only one thing that was positively associated with those positive outcomes was the warmth relationships between the child and the adult in the room. Nothing else seemed to matter other than that just gentle kindness between the, the practitioner, the teacher, and the pupil. And those things matter a lot. Okay, thank you ever so much, everybody. We must end there. Can we first of all thank our panel? Thank you very much, panel. I just want to thank you all for coming along tonight and I hope you've uh, learnt something and engaged with us in a meaningful way and take some good things from today. Thank you. Thank you.